Well, welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I got to tell you something, people. It's great to have Blowfish for Hangovers back as a sponsor. And it's a perfect timing because they came back during the holiday season. And what it is is blowfishes are guaranteed that the holiday party season doesn't turn into hangover season. So after a night of, I don't know, some people call it holiday cheer. I call it boozing. But after a night of that, you just drop two blowfish tablets in water, just two, and drink it. And in no time, your hangover is gone. And the best thing is blowfish is real medicine and it's recognized by the FDA as effective. And it comes with a money back guarantee. So there you have it, people. You use it. There's nothing to lose. If you use it, you don't get rid of your hangover, don't worry. You get your money back. So here's what you do. You get some blowfish for yourself. You get some blowfish as stocking stuffers. And you get blowfish as a gift for that guy, and we all know one, who drinks everything. So go to hangovers.com. That's hangovers.com. And use the promo code COOPER and get 20% off your order. Anyway, we have a a great show today. We have a a very talented actor. uh, Interesting store backstory. And my guest is Mark Avenir. How you doing, Mark? I am good. How are you, Steve? Good. Now, uh, now, are you are you a big holiday? Do you get into the holiday cheer and all that? Are you one of these holiday guys, or are you on the fringe? Uh, I, nah, no, no. I have to admit, no, I'm not. You know, it's uh, being an actor. You uh, schedule is not something that is set. Sometimes you need to just go uh, on a job like on a day's uh, notice and so then holidays sometimes most of the times your usual life is kind of a holiday so uh, like a summer camp you wake up in the morning and there's you know not much to do or there's so much to do so uh, yeah uh, it's round the year thing I know, now you're working on something right now I believe because you said you had to check your schedule right yeah yeah I am uh Working on a few things. I just uh, wrapped up uh, an episode of uh, Blind Spot, which is an NBC show uh, <clears throat> that I shot in New York. And now I'm uh, I'm uh, traveling back and forth between Los Angeles, uh, Malta, and London, uh, shooting in another movie. That's quite the schedule, man. I'll tell you, that's jumping around. So, so I got to now. How how did this whole acting career start? I know. I know you were uh, you were born in the Ukraine, I believe. I was. I was. Okay, so so how do I mean? How does you know? You know, we think about it like when you're born in America, you you see actors and so many kids who know that they're, they they're raised on TV and they want to you know go into acting. How did this whole career start? I know you've traveled and you speak a bunch of different languages. How did it all start? And what inspired you to get into this business? Well, it's. Uh, I knew it about, I mean, up until I was five, uh, I was sure I'm going to be a painter. And then at the age of five, I kind of knew I'm going to be an actor. That was uh, it just, yeah, I just knew it. So I was doing mostly, you know, it was less TV. because We, we did have TV back, you know, in the 60s in Russia. But uh, I think it was more records because on records you had, we had records of these funny, uh, you know, Russian comedians and all that. And I loved listening to them and then uh, doing impersonations and all that. So I think back, it, went, it goes that far, like back to when I was five. And then I another memory that, that is like a, a cornerstone is I was in Israel and they had this uh, show homage to homage to this, uh, to Topol, if you know who he is, the fiddle on the roof. Yes. Uh, Israel. Because we moved from the Ukraine to, to Israel when I was eight. And so I was, I was watching that, and he, it was this show about him and his huge success, success, which was pretty huge. He was nominated for the Oscar. He won the Golden Globes. You know, Fiddler on, on the Roof was, was a huge thing. And back in provincial Israel, watching that show, Roger Moore calling him, and everyone is kind of, you know, uh, it's like his life. And you look at that, and you look at they showed uh, scenes from his movies and all, and I was in awe, and I was like, I, I want this. So you know, fast forward forty something years, and then you know, I'm. It was basically that. That was the Hollywood connection with acting. So yeah, it, but in the meantime, there were a lot, a lot of things that happened. You know? 
Yeah, I mean, what was your path? I know, you know, it's like, I know you served in the military and, you know, most, I know most countries besides the U.S., it's when you get out of high school or whatever, you are, you have to serve in the military. You're drafted. Yeah, not not too many uh, nowadays. It used to be much, much more prevalent. I mean, up until the 50s and 60s and 70s. Most countries in Europe, you don't, you, you don't go to the army. It's uh, Israel is different in the sense that, you know, it's a country that is in a con- constant state of uh, conflict. And so you have to uh, kind of, you know, protect yourself. So and it's it's the it's the people's army in a way. So it's it's a very natural thing to finish your high school and, you know, get get to the to the army and do your thing. And it's and it kind of. You feel it's the right thing to do, mostly, mostly. Uh, nowadays, politically, I uh, I can disagree, but I think I still would have gone to the army. Uh, so basically, yeah. So I, I I finished high school. I went to did my three year in the military, and then I uh, and then my uh, options were I was actually thinking of becoming uh, a doctor. So I, I was a, I, I was accepted to a, two or three medical schools, and I was supposed to go and do that. But then, while preparing myself and making my grades better and all, you know, all that, I just realized that I don't be. I, I decided I'm going to have a year of doing not that, but just doing things I want, because knowing that getting into a six, seven year, at least of studies for medicine. I'm not going to have time to do things I like, so let's have a year of just things I want to do. And after three or four months, I realized that's what I want to do. And all I, all I did from the things that I kind of wanted to do had to do with, uh, back then it was acting, but more focused on, on uh, circus and uh, juggling and uh, street theater that's what i how did you get an interest in that i mean it's something that's you know going from medical school to juggling it's i mean it's it's quite interesting i mean what did did you know did but something it, catch your eye that you went man this is this looks so fun and i can do this but again it goes back to i i always wanted to do that again from 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 the age of five i kind of knew i want to do that i was the funny guy at school i we moved to israel when i was like round eight, and without the language, I would I was in, within a few months I was emceeing all kind of shows at school. You know, I was uh, we had like it's a war story, but we had 1973. There was a war, so the school we were uh, getting into uh, bomb shelters, and I would go between you know uh, the classes and do puppet theater, you know, without the language still, but that it was always kind of my calling that kind of uh, got dormant while I was in high school in the military. But after that, the, the, the medical thing was something my parents wanted me to do. But my passion was to perform. And, and that's why, you know, the first outlet I found was street theater. And then it kind of emerged after a few years of doing that into, you know, full scale acting. Now, how did you make that transition? I mean, I, I know you went to circus school and you did street theater and street performing. When did you say, I want to take this to a more, I guess you would say, a more disciplined? I, I can't think of the word. It's, yeah. I mean, when did you decide? Was there a defining moment or did uh, you just sit I there? Was, that's actually, yeah, I, I was in Paris and I was, uh, I was in a circus in Paris. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> They, there were a few things. First of all, I uh, was, uh, I had a girlfriend who was this Hungarian uh, girl that was thrown knives at by this Romanian guy who was throwing knives. That, that was their act. So we had, we had a, a thing, and then the Hungarian guy, the Romanian guy, really didn't like me because of that. So, you know, I, I was a little scared that the knives are going to fly the wrong way. Uh, that was one thing. And then the circus, basically, they were uh, on their way to do a tour in North Africa, to which I couldn't go, being Israeli and, you know, ex-military and all of that. So, and, and beyond all of that, I, did, I felt I had enough. I spent six months in the theater, circus, I mean, 
And I felt uh, that's not, I mean, I tasted that life. That's not what I want to do. So let's now go to something that is more serious and, you know, up, up a notch. And that's, that's when I went back to Israel and, and auditioned for a few schools and got into a school I really liked. And that's, you know, that's how it continued. So you got to the school and I know, and now, now did you feel, did you feel at home on stage when it was, you know, the theatrical training? Cause you know, you had been on the, the road and stuff like that and street performing, but when you, did you feel at home when you first started getting on stage or did it take a while to you really started feeling that, you know, this is, this is what I'm, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, no, it was pretty clear even before that. I mean, uh, I was, uh, when I got to the circus, it was after two years of studying street theater and juggling and all of the circus skills, but it was circus skills plus theater. So I, I knew I was, that was my path. And when I went to that three-year Stanislavski type of a thing, I was already kind of confident this is, this is the direction. I was like, it, it took me a few years after, even after finishing the school to make sure you know, be sure, okay, that's what I want to do. I feel confident that I can be good at what I do because that was very important. And I, you know, it took me, again, some time to uh, convince myself that I'm good enough to, to make this my life. But uh, but at, at the stage when I was in that three-year acting school, uh, I knew that's, that's the direction. So you do that, you're going through school, and I know you eventually founded a theater company, right? I was a well. I was one of the founders. They it was uh, 1989, 1990 actually, and uh, a group of Russian uh, actors led by an, an amazing director came to Israel as a group, as a theater, trying to uh, make it happen. And then they met with me, who I was. I, I could speak Russian. Uh, okay, I mean there weren't too many people in the 90s my age in Israel who could speak Russian my, uh, on my level, though it wasn't perfect. But, uh, but you know, so they, they uh, talked to me, asked me to do the lead in the first show, and, uh, and that's how it started, So uh, which was Rosencrantz and Rosencrantz and Glinstein, that dead by Tom Stoppard, a beautiful show. And that kind of, I mean, no one knew that this theater, it was supposed to be, because there was a big wave of immigration and at the beginning of the 90s, the, eight, uh, the end of the 80s, when, when the wall came down, the, the communists. Uh, so they decided, well, there's going to be a lot of people coming from Russia, from USSR to Israel. They're going to need culture, theater. They're going to come and do that. So they came and started that and thought they're going to be playing in Russian. But then within a year, they realized that's not going to be enough. I mean, this is a country of six million. We have, like, half a million who speak Russian, that's not going to be enough to sustain the theater. So it became a bilingual theater in which I was very instrumental as I spoke fluently Hebrew and Russian. So, and that's how the whole thing started happening. But the amazing thing was that th that theater, I mean, they thought we're going to, we're going to do a show here, a show there. And, and then that first show that Tom Stoppard won, the Rose Grants Against the Dead, uh, became an instant hit. People would watch it in Russian with simultaneous translation. And it very quickly it was invited to go to the band, to the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is a huge venue, uh, to, you know, to perform. And then the New York Times came out with uh, a piece about it saying this is much better than Tom Stoppard's movie. So it was like... Uh, it started rolling, and within a few years, this theater became was named by the London Times one of the best five theaters in the world. So that's how the whole thing kind of uh, cascaded into into uh, a thing. Now, when it was got you know, when they said it was one of the best five theaters, and you were you were getting you know recognition, did that help your career advance? Did you sit there and then did it help you? Did it give you opportunities because you were involved in this? Some this popular, not world renowned, but popularly you know critically renowned theater. Did that help you start to work more or help well, pursue your well, career? It's uh, it, within Israel. It it gave me, uh, of course, I from and I joined them just 
a, a few months after I finished acting school, I didn't know where I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. I, uh, I had a, a show here, a show, uh, like little things, and I wasn't even sure I'll, I'm going to be able to make a career out of it. And suddenly, uh, a year and a half later, I'm in one of the best theaters in the world, Creator Clear Claim. Everyone in Israel watches our shows. Everyone saw me because I'm playing, playing the lead. So, yeah, within my uh, Israeli environment, it, uh, it, it, was, it was a huge thing. Beyond that, I think my merit and, and, and what I gained from it is just an amazing lesson. I mean, more than anything else, that was it. The, our director was an incredible, still is a director. Uh, the a other actors was, were great. I was on a totally different level than they were. They came from the top of Russian theater, directing and acting, and uh, all of the stage uh, design and uh, everything was was very very high level, mind you. Russia theater wise is a, is, a, is an empire, and they were they were secluded, but they had amazing theater tradition. So so for me, it was just an incredible lesson that lasted for ten years. So you're doing that. So it lasts for ten years. Now, when do you start? Starting to segue into the films, I know you were in Schindler's List, and before that, I see you had a few uh, other parts. When did you start saying, "Okay, I've been doing theater. I want to start doing film"? Well, I, I, I made my first movie appearance, and believe it or not, I, I don't think it's even on my IMDb, but it was Rambo Three, which they shot in Israel with Stallone. So that was like a month before I started my uh, acting school. And I got a, a tiny part that eventually, I don't think it's even in the movie, that there might be an explosion and while the explosion is going on, you might see a blink of my face, but that's it. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, but then the first year of my acting school, I did uh, a glorious movie called Iron Eagle 2. Right. Uh, any, anything I did in, within the first few years of my acting had to have a number. It was right. like Iron, Iron Eagle 2. Delta uh, Force 3. Delta Force 3, <laughs> Rambo 3. Uh, because, because back in Israel, they had Dolan Globus. I don't know whether you remember this guy. He was an Israeli who came to Hollywood. And he, for, for a certain time, was like the biggest independent movie maker in, in, in Hollywood. He was, he was an incredible character. So he brought some of the... Uh, uh, movies back there, and they were mostly crappy. But I was doing those because you know it was there, and but you know it, it wasn't theater was the main thing. It was a great theater. Again, the level of, of performance was was amazing, and I and I was very I'm not film. I'm going to do theater. And Schindler's this came, which was a funny story because to begin with, I wasn't. Uh, I was cast in the movie after someone got into a, an accident and couldn't do it, and it was like a last moment thing. And my theater didn't want to let me go, and blah blah blah. But I and I even I didn't want to go to the audition to begin with. When when the audition started, when the, my agent called me for an audition, I said, "Well, you know what? I have actually, you know what happened? I said, I when is it?" And she said, "It's like Tuesday on." Like 11. I said, nah, I can't. I have a dental appointment. I bailed on them twice. I can't do it again. Uh, you know, the chances of me going into, you know, getting into a Spielberg movie is, no, I'm, I'm going to go to the dentist. And she was like, what are you talking about? And there was a, a big fight. And I ended up going in and doing it. And it was a long process. But within six months, I actually, I found myself in Poland shooting on that film. And it changed my life. Because suddenly you are not doing Iron Eagle 2, with all due respect, or, or Delta Force 3, you are working with Steven Spielberg and Liam Neeson and Ben Kingsley on, a, on an amazing piece of, right. uh, you know, uh, movie making. And that, that was the turning point for me. Though I, I did go to Los Angeles after the movie won the Oscars and did some meetings, not too much, but I came here and it was... A bit too much for me. I didn't, you know, I didn't get it. So I went back, and I did five more years uh, in Israel, in the theater, and only then, uh, at the end of the, my wife actually, thank God, she was like this theater deal. I don't know whether we can do, you know, make a 
family while you were going and doing shows at night and uh, and, and 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 doing rehearsals in the mornings and it just life consuming so we uh we started with going to london just to have a year and a half off me and her and i was studying directing in london and then we went to la because she got an offer to do some she was a producer and then then as as we came 2000 it was here little by little things started happening and within six months i already had agents and uh I was a SAG member, and I have my my I have my first part, and suddenly it it just kind of took off. Now I I'm just looking I was curious with your IMDb when there was uh, you had some series early in your career where uh, Ezra Plus and Inyan Shel Zaman were they yeah. were they series in Israel? Yeah, they were kind of. It's actually a sequel to the same series, so it's a series, and that's five years later. And it's it was uh, how would you call it uh, like a youth thing a series about kids in high school you know like like you guys have here a lot of them so that was that was up until now after so many things that I've done some people remember me from what I did back in the nineties on that show. Okay, so so you come to L.A. and you get an agent and you know you start things happening. Now, what kind of roles? At when you first came to LA, what kind of roles were you getting offered, and have you and and have you know what what were you playing? Like, were you playing across the board, or was it because you know they they they'd automatically want to catch you as a Russian or or Israeli, or what kind of roles in your beginning were you getting offered? Well, I have to say, well, first of all, n- nothing was offered in the beginning. I mean, it's. Uh, it's it's been auditions and auditions and auditions, uh, but the auditions were mostly and it's it hasn't changed much. I have to say. I mean, the size of the roles changed, thank God, and and, and some of them I get offered now. But basically, I would say sixty seventy percent would be. Uh, it's always foreigners or mostly foreigners, but it's always uh, I mean, sixty seventy percent Slavic, Russians, Ukrainian, uh, you know, Czech, Yugoslav, whatever, Armenian. Uh, and then some Israelis, though, because I, I am kind of fair-skinned and, and, and uh, blue-eyed, uh, they don't think I look Israeli, which is funny because Israelis look like anything here. I mean, this, the range is really big, but, uh, but for the, the American producer slash casting director, they look like, uh, like Middle Eastern a- Arabs. You have to be olive-skinned with black or brown eyes. So less of that, but sometimes I get these as well, and uh, yeah, from time to time, maybe a religious Jew or something because because of my nose. Yeah, I know. Was it was it weird getting these TV parts after you had worked with a Spielberg and had worked in an Oscar movie? And I know it's all acting, and I know it's like as you said, you you were an unknown when you came here. I mean, not unknown, but you were not, but. You had, and you started to get juice. Was it was it we was it different? I mean, when you went from doing the that a, a movie like that to TV, did you feel different in your acting technique? Uh, no, I, I have to say no. I mean, it's uh, again. I mean, the, the 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 bottom line is you need to work. You have a family. You have a mortgage. You have payments. So you need to make a living, and 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 that's a living. That's a, that's a nice living. So uh, sometimes. If the parts are really kind of not interesting, I might consider, and I'm very busy with something else. I'm not going to do it. But mostly, uh, no, it's it's a job, and and I try in every one that I do to find something interesting for myself to do. I, uh, you know, it could be. It was funny uh, about two years ago, two two and a half years ago. A friend calls me, who's a director slash producer, and he says, "I have a part for you." And I was I was just after shooting a series in France, so I was going back and forth between here and Paris six times within seven months, and I was exhausted. So I sit in my backyard, and he calls me and says, "Well, this is the thing. We're going to do this, and you're going to go for ten days to Hungary if you want to do it." And I'm to myself, "I'm not, dude. I'm not going to happen. I'm, I'm not. I, I'm sorry, but it's like my inner monologue is I have to say no." 
uh, my friend. And, but still, I'm listening. And then he says, oh, yeah, so this guy, uh, the character, he's a barman. He's blind. He is, he, you know, and I'm, he's blind? Oh, damn. I'm going to have to do it. Right. <laughs> you know, and I, yeah, that's, I can't say no to this opportunity. So, so you always find something that makes it interesting for yourself to, you know, to explore something new within what they uh, offer you. And then hopefully, usually people are receptive to, to suggestions. So if you come up with something that is interesting and helps the park, people would work with you. So, yeah. So you're, you're working through, you're getting these guest parts. When do you start getting series work? Like we said, well, you said you had the series of France, but as you know, what you're, you're doing, and you're doing some guesting on some good shows. You know, so you did Monk, and you did 24, and you know, you're, you're, you're getting on good projects, and which is, must be, for any actor, must be great, because you know, there are shows that are known for good acting and being good stories. When did you start getting recognized for series, and when did you start getting some parts in series? Well, uh, I mean, there's a difference between uh, my work abroad and my work in the States. My, my work abroad is because of the parts, mostly in film, that I did uh, here uh, make me uh, more recognizable in Europe. So, so I had agents uh, in Germany and France and, and Russia and Spain, uh, England, and, and then they try, sometimes it's an offer, Sometimes they ask me to do something, but it's for bigger projects already. Uh, and, and it happens almost every year I do a project uh, abroad that is not American per se. Uh, in the States, uh, I think mostly I would say I'm mostly recognized from uh, Homeland, which, which I did the previous season of uh, a pretty big part. Uh, it, but there's no, you know, see, there's no uh, rules to how it works. Again, sometimes they, someone knows you and remembers you from something, and they say, "Can you? Would you do that?" Sometimes it's just an audition that you that that you were asked to be do, doing. Uh, Homeland. Uh, the story was that they were for the particular part that became a very significant in season five, the previous season. Uh, my agents were trying to get me to read for this part, and they couldn't. They, the casting ended up saying, no, uh, it's going to be cast out of Europe because they shoot in Berlin. And then they gave up after two or three months of trying to, to, to uh, get me into, in the door, uh, uh, through the door in the, in the room. But, uh, and then the creator of the original show that Homeland is based on, the Israeli show, uh, they asked him about a different part for this season, and he recommended me. So suddenly my agents called three days after they said, that it's no, you know, we, we can't get you in. They call and say they want you to, to send them an audition for two parts, for the one that that guy said and the one that we were working on. And I ended up getting, you know, the, one of the parts that I thought was much be better. Uh, but again, it's... Uh, the, there's no, there's no rules. It's uh, every case is uh, is different. Now I know you know you want to get the job, but when you say when there's two parts that you can audition for, in, in Homeland, and as you said, the one part you thought was bigger, and you you thought it would be a better part. How is it hard to give it all to your the second part when you do the audition because in your subconscious you really want the other part. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I will still try and do my best, but of course you have uh, you have your preferences. But it, it doesn't always. I mean, the project that I'm doing now called Entebbe. Uh, Entebbe was 1976. There was a hostage situation, and Israeli, well, French French plane was kidnapped and flown by a, a terrorist to Uganda, to Africa, and there was a crazy dictator Idi Amin who kind of hosted them, and what follow, it was followed by an insane commando operation of the Israeli army, and they flew in dressed as the dictator and his soldiers and released the hostages, uh, which was incredible. Again, 1976, many years ago. And now they're making a movie about it. The guy who directs it is, is uh, Jose Padilla, the guy who, who created Narcos. So they wanted me to read for uh, the chief of staff of Israel, 
And then they asked me to read for Shimon Peres, who recently died, the, the Israeli legendary, back then he was defense minister and he was the president up until three or four years ago, someone I really admired. So I read for both of them, but then I had a Skype conversation with Jose and I said, you know, frankly, I would prefer to do Shimon Peres. I, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. And uh, like three weeks later, I get a call from, from my agents from in England and they say, well, we're sorry, but Shimon Peres is not going to happen. They took a famous British actor for that. And they still offer you the part of this and this, the, the chief, chief of staff. And then it was, I'm just like uh, sharing with you my process of I, I didn't want to do it. I was partially ego, ego of, I, I, no, I wanted to do that. They give me something that is less. But then you, you, you look at it and say, well, it's still a part. And, and I started reading about that. Oh, there's some stuff that could be done about that. And let me talk to the director and see whether he's going to accept it. Oh, he accepted it. Okay, that's much better. And I ended up you know, doing it. So, uh, again, there's no rule. Everything is different. Every time it's a different situation. Now, you say, you know, you've shot in a bunch of series overseas. How does that process happen? I mean, and is it, are, are, the, are the, the TV shows over there, do they have more popularity than over here? Because, you know, now we have so many, so many TV shows. Yeah. What's it like I, over there? Well, I, I know the French series that I shot was, was really, really good. I mean, it, it won the international Emmys. It's uh, very popular in France. Uh, actually, you can watch it here on on Hulu. I think it's called Braco, uh, and it's uh, so so. Yes, yeah, some of the shows or a show I do in Israel on a regular basis, uh, going to be shooting a, a third season in uh, June. That's like the the high the, the best rated show in in Israel ratings wise. Uh, not as much a competition, I guess, as as here. So, uh, but the funny, I mean, the funniest thing about these, these projects, especially something that I'm doing in, let's say, France or, or Germany, I have to speak the language, and I speak some French and I speak some German, but not on, on a level of, let's say, English or Russian or Hebrew. Uh, and then the really interesting yet tough process is to learn it by heart, uh, just to, to, to be able to, you know, be on par with the other actors, most of whom, or all of whom, are native speakers in these languages. So this is the most interesting thing for me, just to jump into this insane uh, venture of uh, I'm going to be working with French actors and I'm going to be speaking French with them on their level, as and they speak fast. So what I think one of the first notes I got from the French director on the French show was, uh, oh, you can do, and he said, I, I don't even remember the term, but it's a t the term means speaking fast in front of the camera without pausing. Uh, and uh, so, so that's, that's the challenge that I have there. Now, now, when did you start learning all these languages? I mean, did you, did you sit there, I mean, with, you know, with France and uh, Germany, did you start to learn them when you knew you'd be getting work, there, work in these series? Or did you already have... Uh, the a little bit of a grasp from when you were younger, or when did you start learning? Oh the no, no, languages? the languages uh, I know from. I mean, French. I I started studying after the military. I decided that I want to learn French, and I and I went to uh, a special school, and I did five or six courses, and then I lived in Paris, as I told you. So so I have that background of French and uh, German. The mother tongue of my parents was German, though we grew up in in the USSR in the in the. Uh, uh, former uh, Russia or communist Russia, um, uh, you know, they had so many states. Uh, and, and where I grew up, used, it used to be Austro-Hungary in the turn of the century, and my parents kinda were speaking German and Yiddish at home. So, so German was something that I heard as a kid, and, and that stuck. So... I can recreate, I understand a lot, and I can learn it, and it makes sense to me. It's kind of part of my, I have it in my files. Now, when, when, you, when you're acting, as you said, with the, in, in France, when they speak so fast, you know, you, you know, I mean, I think acting is a lot by instinct. 
But do you ever get inside your head when you actually have to sit there? Because they probably speak to you and you have to translate it and speak it back because it's not your first language. Does that ever affect, do you think, your acting? Does it ever sit there or do you ever get into your own head going, all right, I don't, I don't, I don't have to worry about my dealing with my emotions and doing this kind of acting. I have to worry about the, so I can keep up with them with their own language. Does that ever go through your head when you're on set? Usually not. I mean, it, it, it all, always prepares, uh, I mean, it depends on how, how well prepared you are. And I'm trying, uh, and if, if, they, if, if I get something, sometimes I, I pass on projects when, I don't, when, when they say, okay, so can you do this and this in a week? And I say, no, because I'm not going to be able to, to learn the lines in a, in, a, in a way I'll be able to work with you guys. So, no, it's impossible. If you, if you give me a month, yes, I can do it. You know, so to that, that how it works. Usually when I do take a project, I know I'll be able to do it. Now, what are the sets like and what is the shoot day overseas compared to shooting a series in America? Are they, is it the same... The same long days because you know you know in the U.S. These no, days. no, not at less. I mean, France, both France and, and 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 Germany. There's no not too much overtime. I mean, not at all. I mean, you do, especially in Germany. You start, you know, at whatever eight, and you finish at six, and uh, and the, there's no there's no OT. It's it's uh, it's very you know set. They know what they do when they. Uh, the, the, the rules are very clear about that. Uh, France less. The French. The funny thing about the French is that they have wine at lunch. That's that's the only place on earth where I saw, you know, in the middle of the day, uh, when you have the catering for break for lunch, and each table has a bottle of wine, which I thought was cool. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the big difference between France and here. Uh, uh, Israel is different because the budgets are much, much smaller. So you have to be, the amount of scenes you do a day is like triple anything you do uh, here or in Germany or France. Uh, yeah, every country has a different kind of tweak to, to what they do and how it works. Now, when you get one of these roles overseas, now do you just sit there and you, you know you're going to be gone for a while or... How long is how long are their seasons? Are they like U.S. Well, because you know, U.S. TV has changed. You know, some networks has twenty episodes. Most of the cable networks have ten episodes. What is the yeah. season length over there? And do you go there the overseas the whole time, or do you try to get no, back? No, no. Again, one of my things when I when I when I get offered these things, and usually these are offers, so I say I can do it. But my, uh, the only way I can do it is that if you uh, put it into blocks. So I come and I do my block and then I go home because I have a family and I can't just, you know, go for six months. Even Homeland. Homeland is a, is a, is a good example because I, they were shooting in Berlin. And I started with two episodes, but and actually one. They said, we're going to get you into a one episode. It might be a two, maybe three arc uh, part. So I went to Berlin, and, and then after two episodes, they come to me and say, well, it's probably going to be much more than that. Okay, and then the uh, production, uh, the line producer calls me and says, so would you like to, what we would like to do is to keep you here from, it It was back in August, from August till November. And I said, I, I can't do that. I have a family and everything. Do you guys mind flying me back and forth? And they were extremely nice about it and said, yeah, okay, sure. And that's what I did. I, I went six or seven times back and forth between Berlin and, and Los Angeles. Sometimes I would fly for a day, which is to fly, let's say, on Tuesday. I, I'm getting on a plane here. I land on Wednesday because of the time difference. I shoot on Thursday, and I go back on Friday. And that's uh, and that, that's how I work in, with an any uh, any foreign production that's that's my uh, way of doing it now like like and you said like in Israel you're involved in a, a very popular series now when you walk down the street are you recognized and what's that like and when you know I mean and what's it like for you or in, in these other countries where you are on these big series do you get recognized a lot and is that just is that just a weird feeling 
Because, you know, I mean, any time you get recognized, it must be a little bit of a weird feeling. Well, yeah, it's still, you know, it, 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 it never got to a place where it's a, when I'm bothered about it. In Israel, it's much bigger because people yet do know me from the Israeli series and from other things because there's a lot of American TV as well. So, and there's more press there. So, yes, so there I'm getting recognized. But it's still uh, on the level of it's fun. There's no teenager... Uh, following me, you know, flocks of, of girls. Uh, I'm not that type of an actor. Uh, I don't have, uh, uh, you know, paparazzi following me. It's just, it's just, uh, and usually it's fun because people are like, oh, we saw you on this and this, you're great. You know, it's, it's, it's very uh, kind. So it's, I see it as fun. And especially, I think, because of Homeland is more, of this here, but again, it's very, it's in a very, uh, you know, I go to Trader Joe's and I, uh, and I buy something and then buy the cheeses. Someone would come and say, uh, I really like your work. And say, thank you. Where's the Gouda? Right. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's the level of how it works. Now, now you've done, you do, you do voiceovers for games. How did you get into that whole, to that whole, uh, that whole part of the, well, of the they, they need, uh, they need, accents and they need languages and because I speak a lot of languages and I you know and there's a lot of demand for Russians that's <clears throat> how I started and then I'm I, because I did lots of games now people know me a bit more so sometimes it's like the, I, I worked with the director and then he knows that on his next project he has this part so he's gonna ask me whether I want to do it on my, or not so like always, when you get into a niche, uh, after you're in, it's easier to just be in it. Now you shoot all over. Now, when you you were also you were uh, recurring on Royal Pains. Yeah. Now, where, where, did that shoot in Long Island, or where did that shoot? It was in Long Island and lots in the studio in New York. Okay, now, now, what was your experience on that show? Because it seemed like oh, it was a, so much fun. Because it looks like a fun crew. So much fun. I mean, Mark, the, the, the star of it, and Campbell, Scott Campbell, uh, uh, beautiful people. There was the, the environment on set was very, you know, homey, family kind of type of a thing. Mark is a very, he's a mensch. There's something very menschy about him, about accepting everyone and being positive uh, on, a, on a regular basis. It's a... Uh, uh, and it projects on everyone else. So it was an extremely fun project to be part of. And, and they are, again, very open for it was a borderline. There was drama and comedy, so you could go with whatever you want if, if it fits that. And from, from the get-go, again, it was a two-episode thing before it became seven. Uh, and the first time I came, Mark, I think, three hours into the thing, he, he kind of turns to Campbell and says, um, he fits our thing. I mean, he is, he kind of gets what we're doing. It was, it was pretty clear from the beginning. Yeah, I, I, I understand it's, I know what they're doing and I can, I can fit into that. And, uh, and that's, that's what happened. It was great. What is it like as an actor? It must be a great feeling when you sit there. I mean, this at Homeland, you're supposed to have just, you know, one or two, days, I mean, episodes, what is, what is that feeling? Does it make you feel like, you know, you know, you're doing something right? I mean, it, it's got to be a good yeah. internal feeling. It's, it's a very good feeling. It, it's fun because you are, it, it, it has to be, you always hope for things like that. When, when you start something, especially something you like, and you uh, you want to be part of uh, you have an expectation of maybe you know you read sometimes I get a script and I and I run to the end of the script to see whether I'm dead or not right. whether there's an opening you know for something in the future so and when it happens uh, it's it's a very uh, fulfilling feeling that's like yeah I did something right that's good now as an actor what is it you know the whole experience on Homeland. I know it was longer than I thought. It's such a critically acclaimed show. It has such good acting. What's it like when you're an actor? When you're around that, does it really? Does it really feed your creativity? Do you really? 
feel like you're you're in the major leagues? Just like, is there a yeah. certain feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have some of the actors. Of course, the actors are, are very, very good. Always, uh, <clears throat> they have top notch writers, top notch directors. Uh, I was working in you. You don't always know that, but I was. I was. Just, there was one. Uh, uh, one screenwriter, one of the script writers uh, that I worked twice with, and uh, on on the show on Homeland, he wrote two episodes, and and we got kind of on set. Very, we were talking a lot. We had lots of fun together, and we continued, uh, uh, you know, uh, being in touch after that. And we met at the Emmys, all of the uh, everything that that. <clears throat> was proceeding to the Emmy Awards and the Emmy Awards. And, and then I talked to a friend of mine who's a producer, and we mentioned him because he's going to work with them. And he says, and I said, yeah, he's such a good writer. And, uh, and then he says, well, yeah, you know, he, he wrote Philadelphia, the movie. Right. And I'm, no way, what are you talking about? So I, I spent almost a year talking to the guy, Without even knowing that he's responsible for such a, you know, acclaimed Oscar-winning movie, uh, and it's uh, again you're talking about difference between TV and, and film. And suddenly, the, in TV, on that show, you have someone who was nominated for the Oscar for a movie he did that was a groundbreaking film in the '90s. Now, now, did you did you go to the Emmys? Yeah. Okay. And now, now you were, I guess, not. It was you were nominated as part of the. No, that's the. I was, the, the guild I, is it's. Which is the one where it's like the they nominate the whole cast? Is that the? That was the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah. That. So I we were nominated at the SAG Awards, the Screen Actors Guild, and I went there. And then I, they didn't have to invite me to the Emmys because we weren't. I mean, the show was nominated, but we weren't nominated as a cast. But. You know, I was surprised to get a phone call from my agent saying, yeah, Homeland, they're inviting you to come, you know, and be part of the cast uh, at the Emmys. Now, what's that like, man? You know, I mean, you think, you know, you look back at your career and, you know, you've worked and, you know, but, you know, there was times when, you know, you were street performing. You know, when you were back street yeah. performing, did you ever sit there and think, holy crap, one day... Yeah. I'm going to be at the Emmys and I'm going to be in the same cast with Mandy Patinkin and Claire yeah, Danes who are, are, are Inigo, amazing. Inigo Montoya, yeah. It's I like mean, me and Inigo yeah. Montoya in the limo. <laughs> yeah, I had that that thought. But uh, more more than the Emmys, I have to say, was the SAG Awards. When, when I did the SAG Awards, that was the thing because <clears throat> during the SAG Awards, it's your people. It's the, it's the actors. It's the awards for acting. And it's for both movies and TV. So in that room, when we were sitting, me and my wife, and we were talking about it, it's like this is the cream of the crop. Of, this is the Hall of Fame of your profession. This is where you want to uh, be when you dream about being an actor. And so, you know, so all of the best shows in town were there uh, nominated for different things. All of the movies, you know, we were sitting next to Leonardo DiCaprio's table where he and, 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 and uh, uh, all of the cast of, uh, what's the, wasn't in the movie of, um, with the bear, where he... Revenant, yeah. the Revenant. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, Maggie Smith with Downton Abbey uh, on one hand and Susan Sarandon on the other People from all of the stages of since you were a kid and you were watching movies and TV, and until now, all of the palette of the great actors are there. It's it's incredible. Now, uh, now, did you meet anyone that night that you were somewhat intimidated to meet, or that someone you're in awe of? Did you get to meet someone who was like one of your icons? Because I'm sure there's a lot of hello, you know, mingling. Because as you said, it is. The actors. Oh, the funny thing, the funny thing on, on that evening was that suddenly Ben Kingsley is there, and, and Ben and I worked together on Schindler's List I mean, together. We were for three and a half months in uh, Poland, and and then so uh, I kind of I, I came to him and said, Ben, you, I'm sure you don't remember me, and and he he was very polite, and he 
tried to make it as if he does, but I said, no, you don't. But let me do something. And I went Google my face from Schindler's List and showed it to him. And he was, oh, my God, this is so, yes, of course I remember you now. I had no idea who he was. Because, again, it was 1993, which is, what, 20-odd years Yeah, 20, back. 20, 23 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I wouldn't say I was in awe. I mean, the only, after, the only time I was in awe of an actor, uh, from the get-go, from when I started acting about 30 years ago until now, was I did a movie called The Late Quartet with uh, uh, Christopher Walken, Catherine Keener, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and, and, and me playing the leads on the movie. We were playing a string quartet. And that was the only time when I was intimidated because Phil is, was so good. I mean, he was, he, he was blowing me off the stage, so to say. I mean, when I was in, with him in scenes, he was just, I, I felt, oh, he's so much better. Uh, so I, I kind of, I, I ended up holding my ground, I, hopefully, I think. Uh, that's what the critic says. Said, but uh, but to myself, with myself, I was I was really intimidated by by how good he was. Now, have you died a lot on screen? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I mostly die. Now, what's what's your what is your favorite death, and what's your least favorite death that you've had to do? Huh? What was my favorite death? Uh. I mean, the longest death was in Royal Pains. I kind of, someone stabbed me, and I and and I was losing blood, but I had a huge scene with Campbell Scott, who apparently, while you know, I had a monologue in which we find out that he's my brother. So all of that while dying. So there was there was a lot of talking during that dying. Um, uh, uh, bad dying was when I'm cold. I hate dying when I'm cold. Uh, so I had quite a, a few of these when when I die and I just need to lie down and 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 I'm, I'm freezing. So it's like either cut or just kill me because I can't stand that. Uh, I, I, I can't come up with something that was the best death right. ever. I need to think about that. I mean, I did over 100 projects, so there must be something that I did that was a nice death. But uh, I can't come up with anything right now. Now, is, is Entebbe, uh, is, is that finished filming? or No, no, no. I... I Came back from Malta ten days ago. I started shooting in uh, ten days ago, or two weeks ago, and then I'm going uh, next Wednesday. I'm going again uh, for a week, and then I'm going to London uh, mid January for two more weeks. Hopefully, because you know there there was a, a, a TV movie called The Battle of Entebbe, but hopefully this will actually. Because I remember, I remember the events. Hopefully, this will really give a view into it and have a better quality of movie. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting. And and again, the director is is Jose Padilla, the guy who created Narcos and and won the Berlin Festival for a, a, a beautiful Brazilian movie, and he did really quality uh, work. So I, I trust it's going to be a good project. And now, when does when does your blind spot air? And now you finished you finished shooting that. Do you know when that's going to yeah. air? Yeah, somewhere in January. And what was that shooting? Sometime. What was that like? Because that's a really hot show right now. Uh, it was, um, yeah, it was good. It was, there was nothing. Oh well, I mean, the only special thing about that was that we shot our last day and the most important day for me on election night. So every time there was a cut, everyone went to their phone or the huge TV that was in the studio to try and figure. No one was interested in, in what was going on on set. I have to say. Everyone was like, what the hell is happening? So that was the main thing about that shoot, I have to say. Now, what else is coming up? Anything, any other projects? You seem like a really busy guy. Anything in the near future? Oh, uh, 
I have uh, a third season of an Israeli se- uh, series that I've mentioned. I'm going to do that in June or July. Uh, in October, next October, I'm going to be shooting a movie in Germany. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's always something cooking. You must have a ton of frequent flyer miles. Uh, I have quite a lot, yeah. I was going to say. Now, do you, do you tweet or do you do anything on social media? Uh, yeah, I, I have uh, an Instagram account. I love that. That's I love photos. Uh, so, so I uh, do that. Uh, it's Mark Ivanier, I think. It would be that. And I have a Facebook page that I think it's Mark Ivanier as well. And I have some Twitter account as well, but I'm not really tweeting. I mean, whatever I do on Instagram, I just put on Twitter. What, uh, what, Most of my following, I think, is on, on my Instagram and the Facebook. What do you have photos of? What, what do you like to take photos of on your Instagram? What, what can we find on your Instagram account? It's, uh, it's a mixture of family and uh, sunsets and, uh, you know, I... I have always have my phone with me, so whenever I'm, I see something, I, I try and capture it. So it's, it's a mixture of family views, my traveling, uh, work. Uh, I, I like my feed. I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow you later. I want to I thank you. I want to thank you for coming on. Now, how do you know Kane? We met, it's just friends. We, uh, we have now I know we have mutual friends. We went for a uh, thing, post Thanksgiving uh, thing in Idlewild, and and there Kane was there. So we spent two nights or three nights there, uh, and then he said, "I have a friend who has a, this great blog, blah blah blah," and that's how it happened. Well, I'm I'm glad we got to talk, man. I mean, your your story is Likewise. your story is fascinating. So people. Look him up on Instagram. It's Mark Ivanier. It's I V A N I R. That's it. And Mark is M A R K. So look yeah. him up. Go to his IMDb, people. You go to IMDb. I always tell you this, but he's got like over 100 credits. So you know this stuff's legit. Go to his IMDb. Look at his. Go go through his thing. See if you can find some of his work. Watch his work. Go back and watch Schindler's List. Go back and watch Homeland if you have it. Oh, go back and watch Royal Pains because it is a fun show. So, people, check him out. Check him out. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at Cooper Talk. That's at Cooper Talk on Twitter. Also, you can go to my website, coopertalk.net, where I have over 570-odd episodes. You can email me, cooper, coopertalk.net. I'll get back to you. Tell me what guests you want me to get. I will try to get them. I can't promise it. Um, Instagram, I'm Cooper Talk One. I only put up, you know, promotion for my show and pictures of food because, as you know, a few years ago when I had that health scare, I got out of the hospital, had to change my diet. So I wrote that cookbook. It's 120 low sodium recipes for one. Basically, there's no pictures to intimidate you because, guys, we look at pictures of food in a cookbook and we go, we can't make that. There's none of them. There's no long, crazy ingredients. If you don't cook with cumin, don't worry. There's no cumin in there. So you can go get it at uh, barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com. But if you go to stopthesalt.com, stopthesalt.com, get it there. Because one, I can sign it for you if you want that. Two, I make more money. That's what it's about. And also, don't forget to go to uh, for your partying needs when you have a hangover. Go get Blowfish for Hangovers. What you got to do is get Blowfish for Hangovers. Go to their website. Hangovers.com. That's hangovers.com. Type in Cooper, C O O P E R, and you get 20% off. So do that. They're great. Follow them on Twitter. It's Blowfish for Hangovers. So check out Mark. Keep following Cooper Talk. I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next week.